Good morning and welcome to DePaul University's Alumni Reunion Weekend Convocation. I am Lisa Bennett, class of 1993, and I'm honored to serve as your president of the Alumni Association and its board of directors. Please remain seated as we welcome the members of the Silver Reunion Class, the class of 1984. Please welcome the Golden Reunion Class, the class of 1959. Ladies and gentlemen, alumni and friends, we are about to enjoy a wonderful alumni celebration today. The Alumni Weekend includes many wonderful traditions like the processions we have just experienced. Before we proceed, let us recognize alumni volunteers who have helped make this reunion weekend a great success. The names of the class chairs and the committee members are listed by class year in your program. In addition, there are alumni volunteers here for next year's 50th reunion planning to be celebrated in 2010. Will the volunteers present here today for both this year's and next year's reunions please stand so that we may thank you. I want to thank all alumni, all reunion year alumni who have supported DePaul's annual fund this year. Your gift of support helps to today's students, helping to create our DePaul. The D on your name tag signifies you are an annual phone donor, and with sincere thanks, we thank you. You may have noticed um, several of the names on the screen behind me before we got started this morning. Our extra special thanks to these alumni for supporting the annual fund for 25 consecutive years or longer. Thank you so much for your loyal support. Also printed in your program are the names of the reunion year members of the Washington C. DePaul Society. 
Thank you all for supporting our alma mater. The, we the Alumni Association's Board of Directors meets on campus twice a year, and the, and the Alumni Reunion Weekend of one is one of those occasions. We just finished our business meetings, and although many of our members had to return home, there are still some here with us. The Alumni, Reun the alumni Weekend is the Alumni Association's premier program. Would the members of the Alumni Board please stand and be recognized for their part in more than 150 events planned annually around the country, and I would like to say around the world this year, and for being host at this year's um, weekend, for this weekend. This group works tirelessly to support you. Another wonderful tradition of this celebration is the annual roll call of classes. Please direct your attention to the screen behind me. Feel free to cheer as you see yourselves and hear the number one song of your graduation year. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the 2009 Alumni Reunion Weekend Roll Call of Classes.
This program was prepared by our ITAB technology interns who work in the Office of Alumni Relations. They downloaded the music and completed the research for photos in the university archives. One of those interns is Jordan Stefanoff, who is helping to run the show today. I think all of the interns, especially Stefan, uh, Jordan, deserve a round of applause for a job well done. We are fortunate to have some of our most distinguished alumni here with us today from, the cla from classes prior to 1959. From the class of 1934, Ronald Gilbert. From, From the class of 1935, Dr. Robert Farber. From the class of 1936, Mrs. Vera May Farber. From the class of 1938, Dr. Forrest Fuller. Forrest Fuller. We have two individuals from the class of 1939, Mrs. Harry, Mrs. Mary, sorry, Hornbacker, and Dr. Jean Stoops. There are five members from the class of 1944 here to celebrate their 65th reunion, and 13 from the class of 1949 to celebrate their 60th reunion and we have at least 28 members from the class of 1954 joining us to celebrate their 55th reunion. Would you all please wave to your fellow alumni or stand and <laughs> This year's 25th reunion speaker took his experience at DePaul and built a, built a distinguished career in bo as both a lawyer and a committed volunteer, both nationally and locally. Many of you may know him from his summit pictures in the DePaul magazine. Whenever he summits an internationally known mountain peak, he always, always, <laughs> files, flies a DePaul flag. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a sincere honor to introduce to you from the great class of 1984, Andrew. <laughs> I practice this, I promise, a million times. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> and congratulations to you on the conclusion of your very successful term as president of the DePaul Alumni Board. You have served our fellow alumni well and tirelessly, and we appreciate your leadership. <laughs> to fellow members of the DePaul family, alumni, faculty, and friends, Greetings from the great class of 1984. It is a humbling honor to be selected to deliver greetings from the 25th reunion class. I am proud of my alma mater and delighted to be back on campus with my classmates to reflect on such a meaningful, magical, significant time in our lives that had such a deep impact on all of us and is still such a strong influence many years later. 
It's not as though one has a choice in the matter, though, for when asked by the new president of the university to deliver this address at his very first official alumni weekend. President Casey, please pardon our awkwardness in addressing you this weekend as this is the first time in our lives that our university president is younger than us. <laughs> From the class of 1984, allow us to welcome you to our DePauw family with our sincere wish for much success and long service in the faithful toil on behalf of our alma mater. We have commended to you a strong, relevant, and necessary institution that means a great deal to us, which we expect to be preserved and elevated under your watch. We look forward to great things from you for DePauw, and when called upon, I trust you will see our class rise to the occasion. And when the mantle of leading our great institution becomes heavy, I commend to you the charge of Henry V in the history play of the same title by Shakespeare, then imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. It is also an honor to be present for this special weekend with the distinguished and accomplished class of 1959. From our earliest days on the DePauw campus, we were mindful of your leadership and accomplishments. With classmates whom I have had the pleasure to know, such as Gay Burkhart, Tom Hessian, Andy Payne, Charles Watson, and Bob Wessling, you have for a generation represented and uplifted DePauw with your long and distinguished service. You embody the words of the author Chaim Potok in his novel, The Chosen. A span of life is nothing, but the man who lives that span, he is something. And then there's Dr. Joe Allen. I will probably recall for the remainder of my days the inspiration and pride we all felt that cold Veterans Day morning in 1982 when you lifted off from Cape Canaveral on the first fully operational flight mission of the space shuttle system aboard Columbia. The Indianapolis Star captured in a photo our fraternity living room packed with awestruck undergraduates cheering your ascent to the stars. It reminded me of that great anthem that our generation so enjoys, Blinded by the Light by Manfred Mann. Mama always told me not to stare into the eyes of the sun, but Mama, that's where the fun is. <laughs> you, your father Perk, brother David, and your children all for decades have served DePauw in so many roles, and our school and we have been enriched by it. We salute you and the class of 1959. As I reflect back on what is memorable or noteworthy about our 25 years since leaving DePauw on that sunny, warm day, May 19, 1984, it strikes me that today we are celebrating such a brief period of time, a mere four years in an expected 80-year voyage on this planet. Why is it still so significant, and what made it so? Well, ours was the largest freshman class ever to have entered DePauw, 768 strong, when we arrived in August 1980. When busting at the seams with a record-sized class at the then most expensive college in Indiana, when the economy was so challenged, three TV stations from Indianapolis visited campus to investigate what was going on in Greencastle. More than a few of us wondered the same thing especially how long sleeping arrangements on cots in Bowman Gym and in doubles, triples, and quads made out of singles and doubles in the dorms would last and where we would ultimately live for four years. We arrived in Greencastle as leaders from our own smaller spheres, predominantly from suburbs and small cities all over the Midwest, strong, determined, and believing that we could find a place and a purpose at DePauw and anticipating a bright future in the world community after. But we didn't really know what that future was, where this experience would lead us, nor how far our boundaries would expand. So it's fair to refer to our class as the bookends class, entering DePauw buffeted by significant world events and emerging four years later forever influenced by forces and events larger than us. Culturally, Disco had died an ignominious death in White Sox Stadium on Disco Demolition Night the summer of 1979, and rap and heavy metal had not yet been heard from, thankfully. <laughs> we were imbued during our four years with what is still classically referred to as 80s music. Billy Joel, The Clash, Johnny Cougar, U2, Michael Jackson, Pink Floyd, The Police, Prince, The Cars, Talking Heads, you know what I mean. 
We'll hear more of that at tonight's dinner. And Bruce Spring Springsteen's great album, Born in the USA, was released only two weeks after our graduation. So it was natural to believe that it was partly in our honor. <laughs> but with John Lennon's tragic early death our freshman year, and the same for Marvin Gaye in the spring of our senior year, we learned not to take for granted the music that we treasured that carried our voice. Politically, our class was shaped by the country's bicentennial in 1976 with hope, but by the time we were making college decisions in 1979, the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan, 52 of our fellow Americans began serving 444 days of tortured and humiliating detention in Iran, and the Panama Canal had been voted out of the American pool of proud national assets. With President Reagan's evil empire speech to the British Parliament in 1982, charging that freedom and democracy will leave Marxism and Leninism on the ash heap of history, and Vietnam invading Cambodia, the Cold War seemed chillier than it had in decades. And by our senior year, the downing of a civilian Korean jetliner over the Sea of Japan by Soviet fighters with an American congressman on board, and the introduction of Star Wars in Congress seemed sure to keep superpower relations tense. Even in the previously untouchable realm of global amateur athletics, the United States boycotted the 1980 Moscow Summer Olympics, and four years later, 11 days prior to our graduation, the Soviets boycotted the Los Angeles Summer Olympics. The Pope, Anwar Sadat, Indira Gandhi, and President Reagan all suffered assassination attempts in our years at DePauw. Sadly, two of them successful. Some of us voted in and worked on our first presidential or national elections in the fall of 1980, when Ronald Reagan swept Jimmy Carter. Four years later, we witnessed the campaign for Morning in America, when President Reagan ran for and won re-election, although the dawn promised was not yet clearly visible. Economically, the country was financially in collapse in 1979 and 1980, with inflation rising to 14 percent and the prime rate at 21 percent. The American population was fleeing our part of the country, the Rust Belt, in record numbers to places like Texas and Georgia, Florida and California. Debates about bailing out Chrysler dominated the headlines. Sound familiar? <laughs> Despite a new direction and new initiatives by the Republican administration, the unemployment rate was near 10 percent at our graduation four years later, right when we began job hunting. Then there are the bookends of a changing DePauw from our start to our matriculation. As the largest class ever to have entered DePauw, naturally there were enough extra students to allow for experimentation in the curriculum, and we witnessed the Q and S requirements for graduation. For the better, semester internships for the new management fellows program were begun. We still only had one or two phones in most fraternity and sorority houses, and on a given dorm floor, the only computers anywhere on campus were housed deep within a cooled, sterile room in the Science and Math Center, and the freewheeling 70s were still the predominant theme for a wide-open campus social atmosphere. East College was just a scaffold-clad old building, and Bowman Gym still had the swamp in the basement in which to swim or take a steam. <laughs> Most importantly and sadly, we had lost four straight Monon Bell games to the uncouth and depraved cavemen up the road 30 miles in Crawfordsville. Well, despite the new alphabet soup curriculum, a majority of our class steered through them and graduated. As we were leaving, you could actually order your own individual phone to be added your, to your dorm room for a small additional charge. We had found the computer room in the Science and Math Center and maybe used it a couple of times, but we were looking forward to work or graduate school where computers would be readily available on a daily basis. WGRE had just gone stereo after 35 years broadcasting in mono. The freewheeling rush and social scene was about to undergo radical restructuring and restrictions, such as deferred rush and registered and carded keg parties. Bowman Park had replaced, replaced Bowman Gym. East College was resplendent in its restored state, and we sat under her shadow at graduation and the Lilly Physical Education Center had opened in time for us to enjoy it our junior and senior years. And our class had reversed the Monon Bell slide with two wins, one incredible tie, and only one loss during our tenure. <clears throat> we, 
What transpired in between as a result of these bookends, we experienced four years of intense change and transformation into adults and citizens of the world. We reached beyond our boundaries and what we knew and what we thought we could become when arriving at DePauw through hard work, intense study, constant interpersonal exchanges, and only occasional social excesses. We questioned, doubted, explored, stretched, and amended our morality, our physicality, sexuality, spirituality, and certainly our normality to a degree that we were much different upon leaving DePauw than when entering, I suggest to you for the better and ready to make our grand entrance onto the world stage. It's important to recognize and offer our gratitude to the faculty for the significant role that they played in our transformative experience. Our faculty was not the visible researching and publishing kind, but was wholly invested in teaching students. They shared our DePauw experience in all places where we lived, in the classroom, on the road abroad, and in, in our living units, and in debates about the direction and the future of DePauw. They encouraged, challenged, and taught us, fully committed to the goal of preparing us for an uncertain future. So many of our professors were instrumental in inspiring us to continue exploration beyond the written text in lifelong learning after DePauw's classroom. I can recount the instances of inspiration by one of my professors in a number of experiences I had after DePauw, which germinated in the classroom, or with a discussion, or a book. In visiting W.B. Yeats' gravesite in County Sligo, Ireland, listening to Handel's Messiah in St. Paul's Cathedral on Thanksgiving, viewing William Blake's art at the Tate Gallery on the South Bank, attending Midnight Mass at Notre Dame on Christmas Eve, visiting Lenin's tomb in Moscow's Red Square, viewing the great masters of art at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, seeing Max von Sydow in The Tempest at the Old Vic, touring Hamlet's home in Elsinore Castle in Copenhagen, and cresting the crater rim at sunrise on Mount Kilimanjaro. I could recollect a spark from a professor that ignited the imagination and left an impression to be more fully formed later. It is just as Bernard Malamud wrote in The Natural, we have two lives, Roy, the life we learn with and the life we live with after that. I have had the good fortune of being able to express my appreciation to DePauw on high peaks all over the world. This public symbolism is similar to the many subtle ways that my classmates celebrate and superbly represent DePauw in their everyday lives, in their homes, at work, in places of worship, and in their communities. My mantra at the advent of turning 40 several years ago, still misunderstood by many, including my spouse, has been from that great Stoic Roman Marcus Aurelius. It is not death that a man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live. Not settling for the ordinary, I've unfurled my DePauw banner atop the tallest peaks of three continents, Africa, Europe, and North America, and on a handful of other worthy peaks in South America, France, and the American West, as a show of thanks to a university that was true to its classic liberal arts mission of instilling in us a sense of exploration of what it means to be a human being, of having a life worth living. As there remain other physical peaks to inspire me over the next 25 years, for all of us there remain accomplishments to be realized, goals to fulfill, and intellectual and societal peaks to master. Our alma mater has prepared us well, and we have the time and resources yet to expend in our quest. Class of 1984, our time is not yet over. Our stories are not yet fully written. Our legacy is not cemented, and our symbols are not yet completely drawn. We are in a position to finish strong and contribute our own individual and collective stories to DePauw's history. I trust that you will do so masterfully as you have these first 25 years. As wrote Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, lives of great men remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Here's to you, Old DePauw.
Thank you so much, Andrew. Most of us will know the 50th class reunion speaker as well as one of NASA's Hall of Fame astronauts and a loyal member of the DePaul family. His spacewalks are legendary, and you can find some of his NASA keepsakes in the Percy Julian Science Cent Mathematics Center. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph P. Allen IV from the Golden Class of 1959. Lisa, thank you so much for that, that kind and also very short introduction. <laughs> it's a distinct honor to represent the great class of 1959 here at our 50th. 50th? Oh my goodness. Uh, and I thank you classmates for giving me this particular privilege. I, of course, was thrilled, Bill, when you asked if I would act, act as a spokesperson, and I immediately said yes. Then foolishly, perhaps, I asked Bill why I was the class's first choice. <laughs> he hesitated. <laughs> Joe, he said, we all were on the campus when Sputnik was launched in October of 1957. And just as we returned to DePaul in the fall of 58, for our senior year, the Space Act was signed into law by President Eisenhower. We definitely wanted to go with the space theme, but to be truthful, Neil Armstrong was our first choice. <laughs> but he had a conflict. Bill, I know Neil Armstrong very well and I'm doubtful about his conflict. <laughs> they do not have a Saturday morning bowling league in Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> and Neil is not a bowler. Nonetheless, I gladly serve as the speaker, as I did for our 25th reunion um, uh, 25 years ago. And I pointed that out to Bill and he said, correct, Joe, and we're going to keep asking you every 25 years <laughs> until you get it right. <laughs> 751 of us arrived in Greencastle and onto the DePaul campus in the springtime of our lives, now 54 years ago. We return now in the autumn of our lives to celebrate our graduation from DePaul, again 50 years ago. Now speaking for myself, and I would imagine for many of you, if not all of you, I am totally enjoying these few days of reconnecting. But all the while, I hear this little boy's voice in the back of my head whispering, 50 years, good grief. <laughs> what in the world has happened and where has the time gone? It's remarkable. As DePauw students, many of us had the fun of taking the uh, terrific course uh, entitled Living Language, taught by beloved Professor Jerome Hickson. From that class, we know that reunion derives from a Latin root, meaning a great coming together to see who is falling apart. Our reunion is much more than that, and let me try to explain. <laughs> Most of us were born in the year 1937. Correct, we are on the average about 72 years old, or 26,000 days, or 38 million minutes, <laughs> or, well, you get the idea. At my last birthday party, my 
eight-year-old granddaughter asked me how old I was. I said, Taylor, I'm 72 years old, very old indeed. And she patted my hand and said, Grandpa, don't be sad. 72 is not that old, especially if you're a tree or a tortoise. <laughs> I felt better immediately. <laughs> Andy, I, I so enjoyed your remarks and uh, remember the times you described as though it were only yesterday also. But I, I suspect that you and your terrific classmates think of yourselves as early middle-aged uh, and probably think of us as seriously older. <laughs> well, I have some news. It's quite the contrary. We think of ourselves as middle-aged and of you as unseasoned youth. <laughs> and being middle-aged, we have, we're halfway through our lives and have many things ahead left to con <laughs> conquer. Now, I will admit that all of us would be more bullish on this conviction if we had a number of friends who were 150 years old. <laughs> when we arrived in this world, our parents, now called the greatest generation, had struggled but survived and were diligently climbing out of the Great Depression. In the late 1930s, a house cost about $4,000 and a new car about $700 for those who could afford such luxuries. And our parents at that time also were nervously following events in Europe involving Germany, France, England, the Soviet Union, and Poland. But not to worry, because our national leaders had proclaimed that we would remain neutral as war tensions built in Europe. Interestingly, in 1939, Enrico Fermi split the atom, and soon after, Albert Einstein prepared a letter to President Roosevelt explaining that if atoms are split in chain reactions, weapons of mass destruction could be built. Now, Einstein himself did not coin the term WMD, weapons of mass destruction. That term, sadly, was coined by naive national leaders in recent times. We, of course, were oblivious to all of this, and we became known as the silent generation. In looking back, we had a lot to be silent about. They were terrific times in which we grew up. We graduated from DePaul 50 years ago, and although at DePaul 50 years ago we were still studying vacuum tubes and simple circuit designs in physics classes, the microchip, which is the forerunner of the microprocessor and the heart of all of today's electronics, uh, was being invented in that very year. And even more remarkable, pantyhose were introduced. <laughs> in January of 1959, Alaska became a state, and it turned out to be very handy because we can see Russia from Alaska. <laughs> And uh, interestingly, just after our graduation, Hawaii became a state rounding out the complete set of 50, a number that has held steady for 50 years. Yes, I'm aware. Recently, Texas politicians are now threatening to secede, <laughs> but it's too much to hope for. And also, no worries, because our President Obama is already interviewing Cuba as a possible replacement. <laughs> Finally, and most important, four years after our graduation, Brian Casey was born. <laughs> What's that all about? Thus, I have the additional honor of introducing you, Brian, to this extraordinary class. And we are so happy that you're here at DePaul 
And never mind your youth, the passing years will cure that. <laughs> and please keep in mind that we have given you pretty much a near-perfect university. <laughs> and we expect a, a robust growth of DePaul's intellectual life and a significant increase in our national pro profile under your thoughtful leadership. You have enormous potential to accomplish just that. And as we've spoken, there is no heavier burden than, an, than a high potential. Also in 1959, Ford's Edsel was officially declared a flop. <laughs> but our graduating class was officially recognized as an extraordinary class, not just by us, but by our professors as well as our proud yet totally unbiased parents. <laughs> and as is often the case, our professors and parents were totally correct. But we're not here to brag about our collective potential 50 years ago. Rather, we're here to celebrate the uncommon success of our class members over the course of these last 50 years. And I'm being honored by my classmates as being assigned their speaker this morning, an assignment given to me perhaps because for 20 years I had the world's best job title. And for three weeks of those 20 years uh, as an astronaut, I also had the world's best job in this world and the best job out of this world. But at most, I am just a footnote in the extraordinary list of accomplishments by my fellow classmates, individuals who for 50 years have succeeded in pursuing the world's best jobs. Occupations that made a difference every day and made this world a much better place for their community and for their families. I'm speaking particularly about my classmates who, who are health care givers, teachers, ministers, artists, community volunteers, charity organizers, and authors. In reading through all the resumes of the class of 1959, updated from their blank resumes 50 years ago, I'm awed by my classmates' accomplishments, and I'm proud in the extreme to be a member of this extraordinary class. Several decades ago, Mark Twain wrote, many years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you did not do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, discover. Had Twain been alive today, he would have simply written, live like the DePaul class of 1959. Over the last 10 years, my wife Bonnie and I have lived in Washington, D.C., uh, referred to sometimes as Camp Runamuck on the Potomac. Uh, and my business has taken me often to New York City and to Wall Street. In sharp contrast to our upbringing and DePaul education, I found myself in the company of powerful individuals who, who epitomized living by the mantra, drink, swear, steal, and lie. Four golden words that I live by. Being well versed in the English language, we DePaul graduates know exactly what those words mean. And several of our national leaders and a distressingly large number of those in the financial world uh, have severely weakened our nation by living exactly the meaning of those words. But we, DePaul graduates, DePaul alumni all, have the advantage of a DePaul ethic and a DePaul education. And here's how we've used those words. Drink. Every day drink deep from the cup of life, for you never know how many days you will have. Learn every day as though you will live forever. But enjoy every day as though you will die tomorrow. Swear. Every day swear to do your very best for yourself 
your family and for your community. They are the ones that matter. Steal. Every day steal just a few moments to do something special for someone less fortunate than you. For the world is filled with the less fortunate. And finally, when you lie down at the end of every day, take just a minute to give thanks for the blessings that have been, give, that have been yours, including your DePaul education. However old-fashioned it may have been by today's educational standards, this education enabled us to be reliable and successful leaders in a world always in transition and often in chaos. And we, the class of 59, can assure you that a DePaul education endures for at least five decades and can take you on grand adventures, spiritual, intellectual, and sometimes physical, across vast distances. A DePaul education travels very well indeed. Thank you, DePaul University. Here's to you, class of 1959, and here's to you, old DePaul. Thank you, Joe, and congratulations. Before we proceed, I would like to invite the class chairs for the 1950, of, of the class of 1959 for the 50th reunion committee to the podium for a very special presentation. On behalf of DePaul University, thank you very much. And you know, um, come again next year if you do that again, okay? <laughs> I have the privilege of inducting new members into the Indiana Asbury Society. The Society is an organization for DePaul alumni who observe, have observed the 50th anniversary of their graduation from this institution. The Society is a special component of the DePaul Alumni Association, and its purpose is to recognize our senior alumni and to strengthen their affiliation with the university. Those eligible for membership in the Society are alumni who are or who have already observed their golden anniversary of their graduation from DePaul University. We held our inaugural Indiana Asbury Society luncheon in 1996. Will the golden anniversary class of 1959 please stand and receive acknowledgement for your induction into this society?
Thank you. It is now my honor to call your attention to the Community Leader Awards, a major new award being represented by the Alumni Association. The names of our fellow alumni being recognized as community leaders are listed on the screen behind me. In its fourth year, this prestigious award recognizes DePaul alumni who are truly making a difference in their communities. The measures of DePaul's success are truly, the, I'm sorry, the measures of DePaul's success are the leaders it prepares who make a difference in the communities where they live and work. Winners will receive their awards and be individually recognized today in their classes, luncheons. Will this year's recipients please stand and be recognized by us all and let us join in congratulating the 2009 recipients of the Community Leadership Awards. Alumni Association Board of Directors is proud to recognize another vital group of volunteers, our regional alumni leaders. Today we acknowledge recipients of the first Outstanding Regional Club or Council and Outstanding Regional Volunteer Awards. These individuals and collective regions of volunteers have excelled in engaging alumni in their region. This year's inaugural recipients are Betsy Crouch, President of the New York Regional Alumni Council and Bob Burney from the Washington DC Alumni Council. The outstanding council of club for this year is the Indianapolis Regional Council which under the guidance of Kelly Smith and Mike Bogers launched a new monthly power networking lunch program that has been replicated in other regions. Congratulations to our volunteers. I now have the honor of welcoming to the podium Dr. Casey, the 19th president of DePaul University. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I want to take a moment first to thank the members of the alumni office who made this weekend happen, and I particularly want to acknowledge and applaud Jennifer Soster and her crew in the alumni office for these full and happy days. I also really want to thank the alumni volunteers. I ran into one of them last night at the Duck, and she goes, you know, it's a lot of work. So, um, you know, th thank you all very much. I, I also want to now acknowledge all the alumni who have returned to DePauw for this weekend. I firmly believe, you know, indeed I know that DePauw is made stronger when alumni return. For beneath all the tents and uh, besides all the runs to Marvin's is the reaffirmation of the central tenets of this university that we are a community, and that we're made stronger when we convene and reconvene, converse and reminisce. And in a world of electronic connections, there are rare moments when we can make real connections and reconnections. It's just these connections that I hope you remember about DePauw and that you feel this weekend. And perhaps having a garlic cheeseburger at Marvin's may not seem like the most profound thing you do this year or next. And, Maybe having a beer or two at the duck may seem unimportant, but at some level, it is important. Unless you ordered a light beer, then you really aren't contributing. <laughs> <laughs> As you may have seen in the program for this morning's event, my talk is entitled, Welcome to DePauw. And even though I've been here nearly a year, this still feels odd to me. How is it that I'm welcoming you, the alumni, back to DePauw? How, come I, how can I be welcoming you when I've just completed my freshman year? So I thought I would begin today by offering a few reminiscences of my own first year here at DePauw. As I've said in a number of venues, one of the first things I wanted to do this year was to listen to DePauw and to learn from it. So I made that my first and my most important task. 
As just one part of that effort, I arranged this past year to have dinners in every dining hall as well as in every fraternity and every sorority on campus. This was either ambitious <laughs> This was ambitious or this was foolish. <laughs> now, it turns out having dinners or sororities is easy. A pattern emerged after our first few of these evenings. I would arrive at the house and ring the bell. I would inevitably be greeted by the sorority president at the door. The president is always named Kate or Sarah. <laughs> She greets you with a firm handshake and she looks you straight in the eye. She majors in sociology and her mother is very proud of her. <laughs> Kate, or Sarah, then introduces you to the scholarship chair of the sorority. She is named Elizabeth. She majors in biochemistry and she wants to go to IU Medical School. Her mom is proud of her too, though she wonders if Elizabeth is studying too much. You are then led to the dining room where you meet the house mom and where you inevitably eat a dinner made up of a large salad with dressing on the side, a piece of chicken, and a Diet Coke. <laughs> you talk with all the sorority sisters who are all wearing pearls, you thank them for a nice evening, then you go home. Dinner at the fraternities <laughs> is different. You go to the door, but instead of nice music coming out from the windows, you always hear the brothers scrambling inside the house as you're walking up the path. At the door, you're met by the president of the house, who's always named Matt. He always is wearing khakis and a blue blazer, and instead of introducing you to the scholarship chair, you're introduced to the Rush chairman, who always has a nickname, like Mojo, or Flounder, or Skip. He is wearing a rumpled dress shirt and a rumpled tie that was found on his roommate's floor 12 minutes ago. <laughs> the other fraternity brothers are assembled in the living room and they don't know quite what to do with themselves now that the president has walked into their house. So they stand there and they punch each other. <laughs> this is true. Somehow you manage to move this group to the dining room where you serve steak. Most of the guys think this is basically a good deal. You get steak at the price of putting up with the president. So, during the dinner, the fraternity brothers who have been selected to sit at your table convince you that they study all the time. <laughs> then you go home. This seemed to be a very nice, comfortable pattern. I was pleasantly making my way through all the houses during the school year, and it all seemed like a great idea. I was proud of myself. Then came dinner at Sigma Nu. <laughs> I was prepared for the typical night when I walked up the path of the house. I knew, though, that things were different when I walked in the front door. Instead of a group of, group of fraternity brothers hanging back awkwardly, I was greeted instead by a very excited group of young men standing right inside the door. The fraternity president, to protect the innocence, I'm going to call him Joe today, <laughs> greeted me with the big news. Dr. Casey, guess what? We have a special surprise for you tonight. We're making Turgusin. What is Turgusin, you ask? I, too, was baffled. <laughs> Joe, the president, that led, then led me and all the brothers into the kitchen where I met another Sigma Nu who was acting as a cook for the evening. <laughs> the kitchen wasn't clean, I want to point out, but let's call the cook... <laughs> we'll call him Chuck. <laughs> Chuck then explained to me and all the gathered brothers how one makes a Turgusin. You start with a large turkey, let's say a 25 to 30 pound bird. The night before the dinner, you completely debone the turkey and lay the bird flat on a table. Then you place a layer of stuffing and a few sticks of butter on top of the now flattened turkey. Then you place an entirely deboned goose on top of the turkey. <laughs> Apply another layer of butter and stuffing, then you place a deboned chicken on top of the goose. 
With string and some wire, you reassemble the bird, so now they now look like a very, very large turkey. You put this in the refrigerator and you prepare to cook it the following morning. Chuck, the cook, explained that they had followed all the assembly instructions perfectly the night before, but somehow, because they had slept late, they had started the cooking process somewhat later than was ideal. <laughs> Chuck, the cook, then signaled the two freshman pledges to get the turgusin out of the oven. The two pledges went to the oven and pulled out the bird, or should I say birds, that were sitting in a makeshift pan. Unfortunately, the amount of fat these birds produce, <laughs> combined with the butter, had filled up the pan. As the pledges brought the birds to the table, waves of fat spilled across the dirty kitchen floor. One of the pledges proceeded to slip to one knee, but managed to keep his hands in front of him. Somehow they managed to get the turgusin to the table. Chuck, the cook, then produced a meat thermometer. He then noted that he had read on the internet that you should never serve poultry at anything less than 150 degrees. Look, he said, pulling the thermometer out of the, and putting it in the middle of the bird, it's nowhere near 150 degrees. <laughs> he then took the meat thermometer out of the turgusin, wiped it on his corduroy pants, and put it at one of the ends of the bird. <laughs> Look, he exclaimed, at this end, it's very nearly 150 degrees. A cheer erupted from the Sigma News gathered there. Joe, the president, declared the turgusin cooked. The two pledges then picked up the pan, brought the turgusin into the dining room. Chuck, the, coo the cook then produced a large knife and proceeded to carve off a roughly six to eight pound serving and place it on a plate. <laughs> Joe, the president, turned to me, handed me the plate, told me to sit down at the head of the table and said, Dr. Casey, would you please do us the honor of eating the turgusin first? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of DePauw, <laughs> esteemed alumni, graduates of this fine university, prodigal sons and daughters returned to Greencastle to celebrate your reunion. I have spent nearly my entire professional life on a campus preparing for this position. I earned many degrees. I wrote a dissertation. I learned about budgets and management. I learned about working with faculty. When offered the position of the president of DePaul University, I studied all the histories of this grand institution. I had, in short, covered every contingency. I was ready. But when faced with a slice of tepid turducin, I knew I had reached a fork in the road. <laughs> My very relationship with DePaul hung in the balance. The future was set before me on a plate. Ladies and gentlemen of DePaul, esteemed alumni, graduates of this fine university, sons and daughters of Greencastle, I want to tell you what I did next. I looked at these fine young men and I thought about the 172-year history of this old university. I thought about the students. I thought about the generations of alumni. I thought about the traditions, the boulder, the moan on bell, the sing-ins. I thought about the faculty. I thought about the board of trustees. <laughs> I thought of the 18 presidents who had gone before me, President Simpson and Humbert, Presidents Rosser, Kerstetter, Kerstetter and Bottoms. Ladies and gentlemen of DePauw, I'm here to tell you that I ate the Turgusin. <laughs> There are so many more moments I could describe, much less dire than this, 
of how one can listen to DePaul. I can tell you of the Sunday suppers I had with students. They could sign up in the union during the week, and the first 10 who signed up would have Sunday supper with me at my house. I can tell you about the time I auctioned off my house for a sorority pool party for a weekend. And I can tell you about the thousands of ways that which in, in which I try to reach out and meet DePaul to listen to it. But in addition to listening to Paul I, and meeting the faculty, the students, and the alumni, I took it as one of my responsibilities to think about how DePaul might move forward, building on what is unique and strong about this institution and seeing how it might be stronger. Three important conversations began this year and continue despite some pressing economic challenges of this year. First, in my very first meeting with the faculty, I asked them to think about what changes or enhancements that could make this place the most exciting place to live and learn in this country. And if I didn't have that level of ambition for DePaul, you should ask me to leave. I suspect that when you think about what you learned at DePaul and how you learned at DePaul, you remember small and, and a small, intense community in which you knew your professors. You remember long talks with them and with your, with your fellow students, and you remember eating with your faculty members in their nearby homes. You remember talking with each other and engaging in a real debate. So when I speak up to alumni, they always remember a level of engagement that was striking. There are many ways you can encourage such engagement when you can make students learn in vibrant ways. There's also a large number of ways in which you can get this wrong. It's been quite a long time since we as an institution have looked at our curriculum, our requirements, and our majors, the ways in which we ensure students know how to write, to speak, and to think. It's also been a long time since we asked how DePaul uniquely and well balances the liberal arts with preparation for one's career. The Indianas and Michigans and Northwesterns of the world, the universities that have programs in accounting and engineering and dentistry may have an easier time of explaining themselves than DePaul does. But I assure you, and I'm echoing what Joe Allen said, the liberal arts institutions actually prepare you much better for the long run than our pre-professional peers. We just have to make sure we educate our students extraordinarily well and that we, cle we are clear what we say we are and how clear in how we pre prepare our students. So this year, our faculty and administration has taken a very deep look at what it means to educate students for our times. The next, next major conversation has to do with the nature of our campus and the ways in which we connect and don't connect to the town of Greencastle. One of the essential features of a liberal arts college is, is the size of the pot, a college of the size of the pot is the ways in which we run into each other and in which we learn. The Ohio State University covers approximately 15 square miles. It has parking for over 45,000 cars. Arizona State University just announced its intention to enroll, to enroll 100,000 students. Penn State has one dormitory that houses more students than DePaul's entire student body. At schools of such scale, students are offered a variety of courses and a plethora of degrees. At DePaul, our small scale sets us apart, and it's our strength. We believe that we learn from each other in a small community. We believe that learning most earnestly happens when it's enmeshed in a tightly woven fabric of community. The question is, does DePaul's campus support this? We've become rather far-flung. DU is over two miles away from the Ethics Institute. Our athletic facilities and over 20 apartment buildings are across a very busy highway. Yet we have very few gathering spaces in the middle of this campus. We have to now think about the ways in which we can enliven the center, in which we can ensure that we quite literally run into each other. We also have to work with Greencastle to make sure we have the type of college town, and you all know what these towns can be like, that will help us attract the strongest students and the strongest faculty. So we have just brought in one of the nation's leading architectural firms to look how we actually use this campus and how we can make it feel richer and more connected. And the town of Greencastle is very much part of these efforts. The third and final major planning conversation is a new effort to tell our story better. A year ago, when I was named to pause president, I had just completed a several month interview process with a search committee during which I learned a great deal about this university. At the end of the process, when I made a, this, my first speech to this campus, I noted by how, sh how stunned I was at how strong DePaul is, how this was a jewel of a college. I don't want this to be a hidden jewel. 
DePauw is stronger than what people know. And I'm going to tell the world about DePauw. I'm going to do it boldly, and I'm going to do it unapologetically. DePauw deserves no less than that. We've just begun a concerted effort to see how we can tell this story better. And we, have, we already have, with just a little bit of effort of telling the story, we've already seen one stunning result. By just changing our admissions material ever so slightly to highlight what is unique and great about DePauw, we saw our admissions efforts explode this year when nearly every one of our peer institutions were struggling to enroll a sufficient number of students. We were instead surprised by the reaction to our offers of acceptance. We sent offer letters to our typical number of students, which should have yielded us 625 students. Imagine our surprise when in late April, when the letters came pouring in, 770 strong of some of the brightest students in the Midwest and around the country. Yep. Every college president I run into is asking us what we did. My answer is always this. We just told the world how good we are. But beneath all these new planning efforts, I want you to know that I know that it's the old DePauw the heart and soul of this place that we are really celebrating. In addition to a year of planning and moving forward, this is a year in which we revived old traditions and created new ones that celebrate this grand old university. We made a joyful noise about DePauw this year. We welcomed our first, year, first years this year by assembly, assembling them together as a class outside of Lucy Rowland Hall. We then led them through a march to the gates by East College and into the opening convocation. The students were greeted there by faculty in full academic regalia, and as they marched across campus for the first time as students and as a class, the church bells of all of Greencastle's churches rang, just as they rang in 1832 when this town learned that it had the, it, it had the right to establish a Methodist college. This year, as it was done in the 1920s and 30s, we had a midnight pancake breakfast for students on the night of the Monon, Monon Bell. It was fun, I tell you. And this year, on the night before commencement, we lit up East College, we put lights in all the trees surrounding the lawns, and we had a, a campus-wide dance called the Paw Under the Stars for all the students and their families. I left the event a little before midnight, and the families were still gathering and dancing. And so, this has been a year of old and new, a year of looking forward while honoring the past. I ask you today, as in years past, to be part of this conversation, to thinking about what DePauw is and what DePauw can be. You are sitting here as graduates of one of the finest colleges and universities in this country, a place that will look forward, forward with careful planning and with courage. But it's also a place that has ghosts in its buildings and echoes of generations of students who came here and were changed here. So if you will indulge me for just a moment, I would like for you right now to participate in one of my favorite DePaul tra traditions. When you graduated, as was the case for decades, the then president of the university offered a charge to the graduating class. We had our commencement just a few days ago, and I read this same and ancient charge to our newest graduating class. And as I read it, I thought it could still guide any lucky graduate of this wonderful university. I want you to remember this charge when you leave Green Castle yet again after this weekend when you go out in the world one more time. You are DePauw, and you should remember what DePauw once asked of you and asks of you again as holders of DePauw degrees. So may I ask anyone here who is a DePauw graduate to please stand so I may charge you once again. Please. Young men and women. <laughs> you have entered into a noble inheritance. You are heirs of all that has passed. Prophets and sages, scholars and scientists, poets and public servants have wrought with patience and sought truth, and the abundant fruit of their toil is now yours. It is yours to use. It is yours to increase. It is yours to bequeath to your successors. The university charges you to be strong, to acquit yourselves with integrity, and to be loyal to your highest ideals. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are in good report, 
if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, always think of these things. Dear alumni, I am honored to be with you. I am guided by your history, by your achievements, and your love for this place. I have had a thrilling year, and I promise you many more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Casey. I think we picked a winner. What do you think? <laughs> now, before we adjourn, just a few announcements. Please refer to the pocket schedule for the events that are on today's, um, a list of today's activities for this afternoon and this evening. Some of the events are sold out. We kindly ask or remind you to please take with you your meal tickets, for that will be your key to eat. <laughs> you can tuck them in your badges. They actually have a little slip, um, so you may hold on to them. Please take a moment to note the time of your class photo, as well as when your living unit is open. Finally, Dr. Casey has graciously opened his home this afternoon, and I encourage you to go out and visit. As you exit the building, you will hear, first, East College tolling 25 times as a tribute to the Silver Reunion class. Following that, it will toll 50 times to salute the Golden Reunion class. We would appreciate and if all people, all of the participants on the stage, would remain for a few moments for photographs. In addition, we ask the Community Leader Award recipients to join us on the stage for photographs. If you could line up over here, it would be easiest. Take the photos over here. Okay. Um, as this convocation concludes, in advance of your reunion lunches with your classmates, the Director of Spiritual Life, Gretchen Person, will offer us both the benediction and thanks for our meal. Immediately following, you will enjoy a multimedia presentation of a newer song, Remember to Paul, written by Nancy Floyd, Ford Charles and John Jakes, followed by the Toast of the Paul, which you may join in when you hear the familiar tune. And after that, please remain as we pass the torch. I actually pass the gavel. On this marvelous day of celebration, let us join our hearts in thanksgiving. Let us pray. Spirit of the ages and light of life, thanks be for this special alumni reunion celebration. We bow our hearts in gratitude for very special friends and memories that we cherish. We give thanks for the privilege of a marvelous DePauw education, the rich blessings we have known through the years, and for your strong presence with us in the good and the difficult times. We give thanks for the loyal support of alumni whose gracious generosity has helped to build and shape this university into the great institution that it is today. We ask special blessings on President Casey, the class of 1984 and the class of 1959, and upon all who are a part of the DePauw story, for all their accomplishments and for the ways individuals in these classes have inspired us to scale the heights and to reach for the stars, we offer our gratitude. We are also grateful for being blessed with exceptional potential for great service. We are grateful for the Indiana Asbury Society, for community leaders, the Alumni Board of Directors, regional alumni leaders, for outstanding council and regional volunteers, and for their leadership which benefits us all. 
May we all maintain a keen awareness of our calling. May compassion, integrity, and respect be our traits. May we possess both a vision of our world made more just by our efforts and the strength to make it so. Bless the food we are soon to eat and those who have prepared it. May it strengthen us to serve in paths of peace. Amen. And now receive the benediction. Creating, sustaining, and renewing spirit, bless us and keep us. Be with us today in our glad greetings, in our heartfelt thanksgivings, in our shared memories and conversations with friends, and in our bittersweet farewells. And when you leave this campus, go in joy and peace, and remember that you are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. duty. If Janet would join me. This is a very bittersweet um, time. I am very thankful for the opportunity to serve you all, and it has been a true honor. As the board completed its meetings today, I completed my two-year term as president of that body. And now it is time for me to pass the gavel to a very accomplished alumna. 
Miss Janet Johns, class of, I, w I was very good until just now, um, 1985. Janet, please join me. Thank you. I'm so honored with this opportunity, and the only piece of business is let's adjourn and celebrate the weekend. Thank you.